Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. I sing of thee, O blessed Christ, since thou hast saved me by thy grace, redeemed by thee at dreadful price, with angels I would sing of thee. I sing of thee, O blessed Savior, thy praise shall now my tongue employ. I sing of thee, O Lord, forever, for thou hast filled my soul with joy. I sing of thee and smile through tears when sorrow comes to make me sad. and sing because I'm glad I sing of thee O blessed Savior thy praise shall now my tongue employ I sing of thee O Lord forever for thou hast filled my soul sing while life shall last at home abroad on land or sea and when the death to life I pass forevermore I'll sing of thee I sing of thee O blessed Savior I pray shall now my tongue employ. I'll sing of thee, O Lord, forever. For thou hast filled my soul with joy. It's always amazing uh, how often. Um, Somebody writes like that, and um, when you hear the testimony of no one ever cared for me like Jesus, and he talks about, uh, I'll sing of thee and with a great joy, but to know the testimony of um, Brother Weigel and what's going on, you would think, how could a person have joy uh, that's gone through what he has experienced? Um, Fanny Crosby prolific writer of gospel tunes, how often she talked about seeing the Lord, you know, when I wake up in glory and I see his blessed face. Uh, and you're thinking about that, and you're thinking, yeah, that's going to be wonderful, except the fact that she's blind. And uh, you're, you're, her, her centering around the things that we do not have, and our hope being in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the world needs the Lord Jesus Christ, and what we need to do. So uh, we want to think there. Let's go to James chapter 1. We're going to finish this chapter tonight, and um, we've uh, just studied a few verses uh, at a time here towards the end, and under the theme of don't kid yourself about the Bible. We're in the third of that series, and we're going to deal with two of these verses, but I'd like for us to back up to about verse 19 to read to the end of the chapter. Now, we're going to deal specifically with verses 26 and 27. So if you will tune in uh, when we get there. Now, I hope you're always tuned into your Bible. I hope you always are. But uh, we want to specifically... Uh, you know, focus on some things. And then I want to remind you along the way of why these all go together. We're in, we're in chapter 1, verse 19. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, 
lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted work which is able to save your souls. Don't kid yourself about receiving the word of God. The agricultural illustration here is of the seed of the word being planted into your life. A lot of people receive the word or we're exposed to the word, but it doesn't grow anything. And we don't want to kid ourselves about that. You see, it's not enough to hear the word. We must do it. We expect when we put seed in the ground for it to produce. It's not the hearing, but the doing that brings the blessing. And we learned how James compared that word to a seed. Then we went on in verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Don't kid yourself. For if any, be a hearer of, if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. When we looked at those verses... We compared the word not to a seed, but to a mirror. And we explained three ways the word works as a mirror in our life. When we hold that up to our lives, we begin to examine ourselves when we take a look. We examine ourselves. We restore ourselves. We fix up what is messed up. And we transform ourselves to be presentable to do the work. Now we're coming to these final two verses and for this evening, and we want to be able to learn to be responsible about sharing the word. How appropriate with the testimony we've heard tonight. But the Bible says in verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Dear Father, would you please bless the reading, because you said it would not come back void. But we also pray, Lord, that the exposition of the word would be such that would allow us to be transformed into your image tonight. Help us, Lord, not to kid ourselves about the word of God, just to think that it's a good idea to hear it, but God, for us to do it. And in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We need to be responsible. We need to not kid ourselves about what the Word of God. We need to receive it. We need to look into it. We need, it, need to let it look into our lives. But we also need to be sharing the Word. A lot of times, we just say, well, I'm a silent witness. Or I have just given a silent testimony. Or I just... You know, I'm trying to just live my life. I, I believe in a social gospel. I want to be involved in, in just meeting the needs of others. And hopefully they'll see something that will allow them to come to Jesus. Now, folks, I'm not excusing you to not live right because we're going to talk about being separated tonight. But I, because if you're not separated, it taints the, the proclamation of the word. You can't, that's hypocritical. But... But somewhere, somehow, somebody has to tell people who Jesus is, what he did, and so that people can make a decision about their responsiveness to the Word of God. We kid ourselves often about sharing the Word of God, and we must get away from that. So, I think the good place for us to start here is for us to understand the meaning of this word religion that is here in verse 26. If you seem to be religious. Now, this term in the Greek is used five times in the New Testament, and we have one form of that word three times in these two verses. So James is not putting something before us that, um, that is well known throughout the New Testament. Now, somebody says, well, we should know more about religion. No, that should tell us that Jesus Christ in the gospel is not as much about religion as it is the person of Jesus Christ. But if you really want to know what it means, here's, what it, here's, here's the space and here's where we study it. It means the outward practice, the service of a God. So 
there is a, be a practice of religion to be able to serve, to give, to do something. So when I use the term a God, I'm trying to be correct because there are lots of ways and places to practice religion. There are many. We don't think of it as often because of what our dedication is to the Lord Jesus Christ, and may he be praised for that. But there are a lot of religions that are not based in that. So that's what we would say about worship. Now, God is making it clear that pure religion or the one religion, the tr when you take away all the dross, when you take everything away, it has nothing to do with ceremonies, with temples, special days, idols, other things that we might think, incense, uh, other kinds of things that we would think would be a part of a ritual to worship a God. But it's rather the practicing of God's word, sharing it with others through three areas, which we're going to see as we dissect these verses. Through our speech, through our service, and through our separation from the world. Those are the ways that we share actively this word of God with a lost world. And that would be a pure religion. It's not what we are doing here. We are not practicing religion here. But James is telling us that the practice of our religion actually is out there. And so we somehow think that when we come through that we're, we are Baptist by religion. May I share with you that we are believers by what we share. And so let's, let's explore this. In order for me to share the word, my speech, first of all, must be right. When I look at this, we see that there are some things that are said about the tongue. And we could preach other things about this, but James mentions the tongue and speech often in this letter. And we're going to come to some of these passages that will help us. Here he talks about bridling. Now, when we're thinking about bridling, our minds normally would go to horses and training and what you would use with a bit in a bridle to control the head of a horse. Because when you are using the reins and the bits and the bridle, you're controlling the head of the horse to get it to go where you want it to go. But the tongue being bridled means that it comes under the control of the Holy Spirit in order to be able to proclaim uh, with the discipline what we want to do in the gospel message. Uh, James mentions the tongue in verse 19. We read about that. Be uh, swift to hear, slow to speak. Controlling the tongue, um, down in uh, chapter uh, here in this verse, uh, chapter two, verse twelve, over in chapter three, uh, many times, and we'll we'll hit that hard when we come to it in a few weeks. But then in chapter four, so James um, is is speaking to the need for our tongues to be given over to the glory of God, that we are using them in order to proclaim who Jesus is. Then, and one of the reasons is, is because I don't know if you understand this, but your tongue reveals what's in your heart. Uh, do you have time? To, can you do this quickly? Go over to Matthew chapter 12. Some of you will remember when we spoke on this in the following Jesus series that we were talking about just throughout the summer and, and, and the spring. But over in Matthew 12, in verses 34 and 35. Matthew 12, verses 12... Um, 34 and 35. The, the tongue reveals the heart. I think this is important for us if we're not going to kid ourselves about uh, the Bible and sharing God's word. It says, O oh, generation of vipers, poisonous snakes, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. What's in you is what comes out. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Somebody that says, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean what I said. I want you to consider something. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You meant it. Because if it hadn't been in your heart, it couldn't have come out. Somebody says, oh, I slipped when I said, and they curse. Someone says, oh, you know, pardon my French or whatever. Let me just tell you, if it wasn't in your heart, it couldn't come out. 
Well, do we need to have the invitation right now? I mean, that's what that says, isn't it? You know, somebody says, well, they made me say this. No, it's my heart that's revealed in my speech. And so it becomes important what we do with our speech. If the heart is right, the speech is going to be right. If we are going to proclaim the gospel, the first place we have to work and look is inside our hearts. A controlled tongue means a controlled body. Over in chapter 3, we're going to learn more about that principle that, the, that, uh, that our people of today need to learn. I've never been exposed to so many angry people debating over each other and without any ideas being given in my life as we live today. It's, it's incredible. And I'm just thinking, neither one of your hearts have to be right. And then it makes me critical and I have to examine my own heart. It's just where, it's where we live and it's a sad place for us to be. Now, so our, our uh, speech must be correct. If we're going to share. But another thing about the word of God is for me to share the word, my service has to be right. When I go on into verse 27, I begin to think pure religion, what I do, how I worship, it is undefiled before God the Father. So it's not just what I say needs to be right, but what I am doing, my practice needs to be right. When we look at ourselves in the mirror of God's word, like we explored last week, we look into that mirror and we've seen ourselves we see Christ, we compare, then we must see others and their needs. It's not just a matter of what I see, but if I'm going to practice religion, I have to begin to see what is going on. Why would we plant a church out of this church, send missionaries or support missionaries? Because we have come to understand to see the need. Amen? When we, and I'm telling you the reason somebody says, well, there's not many people being saved. Uh, There's not many people walking the aisle. I will tell you quite bluntly. I'm going to tell you with compassion. I'm going to preach and point not just a finger at you, but four at me. But the reason more people are not coming to Jesus is we really don't see their need. We're not shocked at the condition of the world and their lostness. We don't come with a burden. We don't fill the altars with people in tears over people saying, Lord, I want to see this person saved. Doesn't matter what the preacher preached about. It doesn't matter uh, who was in the service today. It really doesn't matter uh, what anybody thinks about me. But God, if you don't save somebody, I feel like I'm going to die because I want them to come to know Jesus. And it may be a family member, but I'm telling you, it gets to the point here where we must see the needs of others as the Lord does. The prophet Isaiah first saw the Lord. In Isaiah 6, then he saw himself. He was a man undone of unclean lips. Do you remember that? And then he saw the people to whom he was minister, and he said, here am I, send me. Isn't that the order that that was in? You can review that, but... When you come before the Lord and we worship Him and our speech gets right, then we are able to see the needs of others. And that's what pure religion is going to be. You see, works are no substitute for deeds of love. What I think is good is not necessarily what God has led me to do. Uh, when, when we look over here, just, just turn the page. Some of you won't have to. But in James, the second chapter, look down at verses 14. And I'm not preaching it, I just want to show it to you. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now let me just tell you briefly what what the issue is here. Sometimes we'll say, okay, there's a need, and it's out here, and we'll ship some money. And sometimes that is a that is a needful thing. If there's a ministry and we need to get something on the field and there are people there. But there are a lot of times when we are giving to a ministry or we want to give money at something and to ease our conscience, 
But when we see someone at Walmart or we see a waitress and we see a need, we don't want to get involved in their personal life when you are the one that God is saying, I want you to work right here. This is where I want to touch that life. This is where in my person, inside of you as a spirit-filled Christian, I want to touch that life and I want you to do the work. It's not a works salvation. It is a working believer. And that's why, why we need to do that. If we're going to have a pure religion, we have got to be sensitive to the fact that when somebody says, where was so-and-so today? A working Christian picks up the phone and finds out. That, that's, what, that's what we do. We don't say, well, where was so-and-so? Now, it may be a part of a conversation, but we're not going to leave it there. We're going to be involved and say, here am I, send me. Ministering staff at your church is not a substitute. You don't pay someone else to do works for you. That, that doesn't, that, that's not going to do that, okay? Because if you did that, Brother Eric, I would never be able to have breakfast with your class next Sunday morning. You've got to do that. No, you got to, I, I'm saying it comes out in practical ways all over the place. Not everybody's supposed to do that. Some are, but there are others that need to help fix a car or buy a backpack for school. I, I don't know where it is, but if you will let God begin to work in your life, he's going to use you in the work area in your service to be able to lead people to the Lord. Then the third thing that we see here is in order for me to share the word, I must remain separated from the world. Now, it's interesting because... It says here we, to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. But when we see this word, the word world in scripture, it means living in a society without God. Can I get a witness? I mean, we live in a society without God. We understand what that word world means, living in the world. But believers are supposed to be separated from that influence of the society that lives without God. We are supposed to be influencing people and have a society that includes God, not that ostracizes or we just get along with everyone. Folks, we ought to be oil in water when it comes to us being involved in a society that it lives without God. It ought to shock us when we hear sin uh, mentioned uh, frivolously. It ought to bother us when things are wicked. It ought, to, uh, it ought to vex our souls to be in the presence of someone that just accepts uh, sin most readily. We, we, shouldn't, we, shouldn't be, we, ne we should never acclimate to that. Satan is the prince of the world, according to John 14, 30. He, he's the prince in the power of the air, and he's the one in charge of that society without God. Now, I'm just going to ask you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, is that the society you want to be a part of? Is that the society you want to rub shoulders with? Is that where you want to exist, is in that society without God? Do you want to live in the world? Now, you say, well, I don't know how to not do that. Folks, we... We can be in the world, but not of it. I mean, we're here, we're breathing air, we're sharing COVID, you know, we're, we're doing this with the world. We're doing these things. This is happening. But I'm telling you, we do not have to be godless in our activity. This is the reason I have problems with terms like seeker sensitive or where we do things that we say we must become relevant to our society. Now, folks, I'm not against technology. I'm not against um, what, what happens in innovation. I'm not. But for us to become relevant or say that I have to compromise something in order to reach someone that is lost, that is contrary to the word of God. Because Jesus, the very word himself, says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's pretty relevant. And sometimes we need to think about that. We think, well, I want to be more modern. And sometimes that means I can't listen to certain music. Or we say, I just want to be more fashionable. 
There's some clothes I cannot wear. And it's inappropriate in certain places. There are certain things and, and, and there are certain belief systems. There are certain people. I can't be in association with them. I, it's probably not a good idea for me to go to the bar to witness to the drunks, but I might can go to their house. I don't have to be of the world. I don't have to live in the world, and I don't have to trick, take a drink so that he'll accept my message. In fact, quite the opposite is true. And sometimes we get sucked into to belief systems, and we let people, we're afraid we're going to be laughed at or made fun of. And the real truth is that people that have no intention of living correct for Christ, they're the ones that are laughed at because they're weak. And I begin to think about these things here, and we need to, we need to realize that Satan's in charge of that world, that society without God. And, the, and lost people, by the way, lost people, they are the children of the world, according to Luke 16. Jesus was talking to them, you are of your father, the devil. You, you are of the world. That's who you are. Now, if you want to associate there and you do not separate yourself and you never ask the Lord what you should do, then you're of the world. And you may be lost because it should make a difference what your heavenly father thinks in your citizenship in heaven. That should matter more than what the world thinks. And so when he tells us about why we're ineffective in our witness, sometimes it's our speech. Sometimes um, when we think about this, it's in our service. But oftentimes it's a matter because we choose not to be separated. Now, just by a contrast here, the, as children of God, we are in the world physically, but not of the world spiritually. Turn with me to John chapter 17. Here is... Uh, Jesus speaking to the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, and He is praying for us. Uh, I often speak of this passage as being our Lord's prayer, uh, the other being the model prayer, but when we look at this prayer of intercession, this is what our Lord really was talking to God about us. It was on our behalf. John chapter 17, just look with me what Jesus was saying to God about you and I in verse 11, he says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, speaking of you, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Here is Jesus praying for you and I to not succumb to the world, to be separated. You're saying, well, the disciples had it easy. Jesus was there. And we just followed Jesus and did what Jesus did. I'm telling you they had problems. James and John had a problem with their ego, right? One to sit on the right, one to sit on the left. Peter denied the Lord. Others, Thomas doubted. Uh, do, need we go down the list? And if we go down the list, just keep in mind, we're coming to you. Because we have problems with separation. We can say it's a great Baptist uh, idea, a, a doctrine of scripture, but the real issue is a lot of times we just want to kind of meld in and look right. Um, uh, we left our son at Heartland and, and uh, he's there and all of my children are homebodies and, and I don't feel so bad about that. But one of the things I kept hearing, and I'm not saying he was being worldly when he did this, but a lot of times he would say, well, everybody else's parents are here. Everybody else is. Everybody. And I said, it's just not, you, there's more there than you think. Because a lot of times we look around and even in our Christian circles, we, get, we succumb to the fact that we think we want to fit in and be like everybody else, don't we? We, we just do. 
We go to a preacher's meeting, you know. Am I supposed to carry my Bible under my right arm or my left arm, you know? Is my tie too long, too short? Do I wear a tie? Do I not wear a tie? We, we, we want to be sure that we fit in even in our circles. The real fact is, is we need to give more attention to being separated from the world than where we fit in. And that's coming between you and the Lord. And you must ask Him. Because you can follow the rules. But if it's not in your heart and you're not separated unto Him, you're never going to be effective in sharing the gospel. And that's where we must be. We must be able to share the gospel. Since we're sent into the world to win others to Christ, then we must maintain our separation from the world so that we can serve others. Then the world wants to to put a spot on us. Did you say, see where it says that we're to remain and keep himself unspotted? What happens? We talked about this defilement and we talked about looking into the mirror. But once that spot is there and we don't deal with it and we're not transformed, the spot grows and it contaminates and it defiles. Remember where we talked about how that there is a progression of sin, there is a process of sin. And when we begin to do that, when every man is tempted, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and when he, the lust hath conceived, it has brought forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That was up in chapters, in verses 14 and 15. It starts with that spot. And we must remain unspotted, or we fall into that trap of the progression of sin, and if we remain unspotted, that it cannot grow in our life. That means we stay separated. There's times when we, in our house, um, we have a boot rack and we live out and we're in the country and, and a lot of times the boots are there so you can put them on because if it rains, if it ever rains, uh, we're going to have some mud and we intend for the mud to stay outside but at least it's not supposed to come past the boot rack. So you take your boots off and occasionally you'll see someone that will just out of convenience step on in and get a drink or they'll come into the kitchen and there are tracks. It spots up the floor and it, or has the, then somebody comes and walks in that and it gets on the carpet or other places where you don't want it to be. Folks, if you don't remain separated in your Christian life, I'm telling you the world is going to be in places in your life you never intended for it to be. It will happen. It will happen. We have to remain unspotted. There has to be a line, and that comes from a separated life. That's what we do, and that's what is supposed to be. We should encourage others in that. Not point fingers, but encourage others to righteousness. The world wants to spot the Christian, and then it begins that defilement process. And that begins a friendship with the world. When you look over in chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. You become his enemy. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now that ought to be enough to say, I don't want to be of the world. I want to be separated. Because if I ask you point blank, do you want to be an enemy of God? Everybody would say, oh no, I'm not an enemy of God. But then we flirt with the world. Separation is needful for us to be able to have a witness. Don't kid yourself about separation. It's not, it's not worth us being able to do that. Then if we do that and we become a friend of the world, then it leads to a love for the world. You don't just stay in one place in, in your relationship. Turn with me to 1 John. It's just a uh, keep going to the right in your Bible there, past First and Second Peter, and go to First John and look at uh, chapter two. Down in verses fifteen and sixteen and seventeen, it says, "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes the way, and the lust thereof." But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That should be, that should be a create a desire for me to remain separated. I don't want to get into this love of a society without God. 
I need to fall in love with a society with God. The next step to be, is becoming conformed to the world. Once we do that, then we pray like Romans 12, that we be not conformed to what? Folks, it's, it's a process again. We don't just stay where we are. We become conformed. You begin to look like the world. You dress like the world. You listen to the same music of the world, and we'll call it Christian. We'll call it, uh, we'll, so to speak, baptize it. We look like it. We smell like it. We talk like it. We try to say we're, we're trying to relate, but the real fact is we're not relating to the world. We're conforming to the world. Is what the Bible teaches. And the end result is then we are condemned with the world. Look quick, quickly with me at 1 Corinthians. I just want you to see this progression because sometimes we, we see these things. The preacher says it. I want you to hear it from God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 32. It says, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. The world's going to be condemned. We want to be so much like the world and in the world and conform to the world, and we don't want to be separated. We wonder why people aren't going to be saved, but we forget that the world, that society that lives without God, is condemned. And that's what we're here to share the gospel about so that people will not be condemned. And we must be able to show them that. Now, we don't lose our salvation and uh, but we do lose all that we've lived for. What we say, we lose our testimony. We lose our influence. We lose attendance. We lose support for missionaries. We lose our, the power in our prayer life. Everything that we say that we are about in that pure religion, we lose that. And so we must be careful. Now, Lot, in the Old Testament, the nephew of Abraham is a good illustration. Because when it came to along where the land could not support both herds and all of the people. Abraham and Lot went out and Abraham said, if you go this way, I'll go this way. And we don't want our herdsmen to argue. And if you go that way, I'll go the other way. And Lot cast his eyes and he saw a beautiful valley and it says in the word of God that he pitched. In other words, he went, set up his camp, he set up his uh, business toward Sodom. The next thing he did was he began to love it, and it, it was hard to go into town for supplies and whatever, so he moves into Sodom. And then the next thing, after there, it says he even became one of the men that sat in the gate. And not long after that, Sodom moved into Lot. In other words, he became conformed. And then whenever judgment came and the world was condemned, being Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot lost everything. Now, he didn't lose his life, but he lost everything else. And I just want to tell you, dear church, that when we look at this and we kid ourselves about the Bible and sharing the Word of God, we sometimes just think that Tinkerbell is going to come out of Disneyland and he's going to fly over Ponca City and we're going to and just put a little dust around and people are going to get, come and get saved. No, there is a process that, that in our speech, in our service, and, and in our separation that will take an active place in our lives so that when the Holy Spirit indwelling us allows us to do those things so that the Word of God is received. And we're able to put the mirror up. We're able to put the seed in the ground. And we're able to see people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we're just living like Lot. We don't have to have the name Sodom written on the town signs around here. But it's going to become that way. Abraham remained in the society of God. Are you getting the picture? He remained in the society. In fact, the Bible calls him a friend of God. And then, so he has a ministry to others. He's one of the ones that actually rescued Lot at one time at another time of the history of, of Sodom. If he hadn't have been there, Lot wouldn't have been taken, kidnapped. But he was. And a lot of times, the ones that come to the rescue are the ones that are a friend of God, the ones that are separated, the ones that are speaking right. 
So it's not necessary for a Christian to get involved in the world to have a ministry to the world. Jesus was unspotted. That's what 1 Peter 1.19 says. Yet he was a friend of publicans and sinners. So I'm not talking about us taking a better than thou attitude. I'm not saying we don't meet people. I'm not, because you're, you're going to have to introduce yourself. You're going to have to talk to people in order to tell them about Jesus. But we don't come on their terms. Uh, that's not the way it works. We, we've got to get to the point, folks, where we quit kidding ourselves about what it takes to share the word. We need to stay pure. We need to guard our speech. And we need to stay away from the world. Those are the things that, that we need to do. What a challenge for us in the book of James. I, I know what Martin Luther said about James being the straw gospel and, you know, that we're trying to mix works with salvation. I, I've read those things, but that's not the message of James at all. The message of James is that we are living in this world and there is going to be work that needs to be done. And if we're going to do it, it's going to be effective that our works are a result of what salvation has done in our lives. It's not so we can be saved. It's because we're saved. And I would just ask you very simply, if you are a saved follower, a believer in Jesus Christ, are these things present in your life or are you kidding yourself? What is going on? You know, or is your speech right? Is that something that needs to be evaluated? What you say, how you say it. And that's a heart issue, remember? Is there something in your speech that needs to be dealt with? Is your service correct? Why we serve and how we serve, or are we delegating that to someone else? Or are we seeing that what Christ might want to do may be with my hands? Is my service correct? Is my separation right? Have I come to a point where I've let the Holy Spirit tell me what is right and wrong, and then I'm able to dedicate my life to say, these things I don't do, these things I perceive to do, so that I can tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. My service needs to be right. And so let's don't kid ourselves about sharing the word. It's your responsibility as a believer. And if you're going to take on that responsibility, these areas of life must be dealt with, beginning with our heart, our service, our separation. You know where the Lord is dealing tonight. Is there somebody that is breaking your heart because they are lost, because they're living? And a lot of times... I would just be very, very candid with you about this. I hear it more and more. It could just be where I'm at in my ministry. But I hear more and more people trying to explain to me why they believe certain people that are living a lost lifestyle, why they believe that they are saved. Well, I just know they're a good person. And, and, and I know they told me that they trusted in Christ. And they've just fallen away. I think sometimes we accept that, maybe as a parent, maybe as a grandparent, maybe as a friend, an observer. I think sometimes we do that because we're kidding ourselves about our lives. In other words, we can understand why they would live that way because we're pretty close to the world ourselves. When we need to be separated. Because I'm not talking about being judgmental. But there ought to be some things I don't understand how a person can live like that and claim that they're saved. And if I'm not kidding myself about the word of God, I shouldn't understand how I could live this way and claim the name of Jesus Christ and wonder if somebody's going to receive the word of God when I am in the society without God. I need my heart right so that the word of God will not return void in the lives of the people that I want to be saved. Let's don't kid ourselves about those things. Let's don't kid ourselves about receiving the word. Let's don't kid ourselves about uh, what we examine in the word. And let's don't kid ourselves about sharing the word. Amen? I think we need to do some business with the Lord tonight. The altars are going to be open.
if, we're, if we don't have someone on our heart, then we need to come and just ask, God, would you put someone on my heart? If there's a reason that I've not shared or able to share, then we need to come and make that right, don't we? And if there's someone here that needs to be saved, we need, definitely need to get that right. All of these things are the message of James to our hearts. Let's let him work tonight. As we bow our heads, we're going to pray. Some of you may This is Pastor Ken Newport at Second Baptist Church. Once again, just thanking you for taking the time to view the message today. Messages from God's Word always bring up questions, don't they? Some to the commitment, just like we've heard in the message today. Others are searching in our own souls about some things that maybe we're unsettled about. I found out that one of the questions that haunts us most of the time is, am I certain that I will go to heaven when I die? God's Word is really clear about that. In fact, it tells us, these things have I written, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Let me just tell you what God's Word says about eternal life. First of all, there's kind of an impossible situation. God says that only those that are perfect, like Him, can enter in heaven. Revelation tells us that nothing that's abominable, anything that has blemish on it in any way, will be able to cohabitate in heaven with Him. Now that sounds rather crass, it sounds rather limiting, but I would tell you that we wouldn't want a God that was anything less than perfection because we would wonder if He could really help us. But the truth is, we are helpless. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, there's something that tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we need an answer, but God has provided that. He says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What about this gift? God has says it is a gift. Who is that gift? What is that gift? John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There it is. That's the gift his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It comes down to this. I need to recognize that God is great. I'm not. He has provided for me a way for me to be with him through his perfect Son, Jesus Christ. And by praying to receive Jesus Christ and repenting of my sin, coming to the end of myself, then I have the opportunity to spend eternity with him forever. In fact, it's even a guarantee. The Bible says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. It's a gift that God has given to you. Now, I would just challenge you to just take a few quiet moments, review these things, maybe look on our website where I've printed out some of this information so that you can look it up in your own Bible and see exactly what God says. And then if you pray, I would love to know about that or any decision. Perhaps you're wanting to know about how to join a church or perhaps there's a situation of life that's a particular challenge and you want to know what God says about that. Check us out on our website and then let us know by contacting us there. The numbers are on the screen for our church, and we want you to know that you can join us at any time in person. Would love to hear from you and meet you personally. Thank you for your time, and God bless.